today I'm delighted to welcome Kit Stapley and um, Kit is rather an unusual lady to say the least. She has been uh, we, well we've been friends for, for some time now and um, Kit you've just become the Britain's first ever gender intelligent dating coach and you graduated mm -hmm. as a Mars Venus coach. Explain uh, yourself, uh, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> I have, and um, it just feels like a natural culmination. I have to say you're one of the reasons that I'm no longer um, majorly doing health creation and working with, with um primarily cancer patients. I use health creation still, obviously, but when I first started working with, with people who were going through the cancer journey, because I'd had such a hectic cancer there journey myself, no like you, around. And then when we met, I was so awed by your breadth of knowledge and your effectiveness that I began to feel a bit redundant. <laughs> Oh dear goodness. Uh, and that sort of freed me up. Um, you know, you have commented um, about you should never take advice from somebody who doesn't have grey hair. <laughs> and um, and I, I think that's true. I hadn't thought of it before, but I really do think it's true. Because what comes with your grey hair is experience and... Um, consistency you know in health trials the ones that go on for 50 years are like gold dust they're worth so much more and and us as warriors through the the years that we have got our gray hairs have learned such a lot it's always important to look at who you genuinely are and i from way back you know it was always romance and love and uh, matchmaking and singles parties and uh, introducing things. I just do all those things very well. I mean, I have twin boy godsons who are only in the world today because I had a very crazy dinner party, <laughs> which was to introduce my lovely single girlfriends to single men. So I, I love all that. And you holding the fort with cancer and giving me somewhere to refer people to freed me up to go to what is my avocation. And in fact, it's a passion as well because I, I'm terribly, terribly blessed in my life. Um, I just absolutely love the man I'm married to, the place I live. The, the way we live, um, everything about my life, but I still have regrets and envy. And, um, and what I envy are people who know nothing about divorce, who have stayed the course, who enjoy their children together, who enjoy their grandchildren together from a really solid um, base. And, and so I'm a Mars Venus coach and I've specialized in dating because that's where you lay down the foundation of a really solid relationship that can go the distance. I decided I was going to take the Mars Venus training and it was, it's been the best thing I've ever done. It's amazing. For the benefit of the listeners, Mars Venus, there was a famous book, isn't there? The first one came out in the 80s, I believe, 90s, about 25 years ago anyway. And it was called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And it's actually changed the language around relationships. Some I read an article recently that said, you know, Mars, Venus, you know, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus is like a joke. Um, but it it has some some good points. But actually, John Gray, who qualifies, and I don't say this lightly, qualifies as a genius in my book, um, has redefined how men and women relate to each other. And the way he's redefined it 
is by using his relationship as a laboratory. So he looks at things and goes, now what's really going on there? So he's done a huge amount of research on how male and female brains actually work and how they're physically different and, and why we are therefore different. But um, the things that bring it home to people are the stories he tells. He said I'll to his wife, example. Bonnie, one day, oh no, Bonnie said to him, would you like to go to, to the um, agricultural fair um, on Saturday? And he said, no, been there, done that. Yep, no. And she said, oh, I was hoping we could go together and make it a day out. And he said, well, you didn't say that. You said, would I like to go? <laughs> and I wouldn't. But if I get to spend the day with you and drive you and, and it would give you pleasure, I'd love to do that. Now, do you find that a singular story? I just think that's so illuminating. Well, it's about language, isn't it? It's about language and um, what, when we say things, we know what we mean, but other people don't know necessarily what we mean. We know we, what we mean, but the way we come across very often is um, heard and accepted by different people. I mean, there's, there's a saying that if you're in a room full of 10 people, you'll probably get 15 different variations of what they think you said. Exactly. Exactly. But it's also the fact that male and female roles have changed hugely in the last 25 years and the 25 years before that. And one of the things that is different is that, that women are now occupying what was traditionally male space, you know, going out to work and uh, work is, is almost always a very testosterone environment um, because it's about problem solving, action, and those are, those are testosterone-y kind of activities. And men and women have, both have testosterone at very, very different levels, um, but women come home testosterone depleted and they need a different way of replenishing their testosterone levels than men do. And the awareness of how our gender differences operate help us to create a harmonious relationship where your stress is something that isn't amplified and aggravated by your partner it's actually soothed and relaxed. And in order to do that, you have to understand where each other are coming from. So in that little, that little um, example, John was actually sounding quite pedantic. You know, he was literally answering, do you want to go? No. But this wonderful thing that um, I think a lot of women fail to appreciate which can make our lives so much better is that men actually feel successful they, and them feeling successful boosts their testosterone and they feel successful when they succeed in making their woman happy so women traditionally because of the way we are we women understand each other so well um women offer things they don't it's not good manners on venus to say will you do so and so for me but for a man he needs to be specifically asked and then appreciated and so women very often get that wrong by thinking well if he loved me he'd know what i wanted they don't. <laughs> they just don't. Um, some of them may do, but the implications need to be established. It's like at the beginning of a contract, you establish your terms of reference. 
Does that make any sense? It does. But when you when you start off, you know, the beginning of a contract, when you're you, when you're dating, you're doing your courtship and all the rest of it. Goodness knows how young people are going to do that in today's. I'm I know. Start ranting. So we'll, we'll, but that's a that's <laughs> <my> story. <laughs> Um, well, well I think that's where our grey hairs come in because we can see the long view of that. Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, the sad state of affairs. I mean, we, we're not going to have the, you know, coaching up together in the back seat of the movies and all this sort of thing that um, many of our generation did. So it's not going to be allowed in, in the future. But um, you, you mentioned about being testosterone depleted when women come home from work. What, what, what yeah. do you mean by that? How does that work? Well, I'm not. I'm not um, an expert on hormones, um, but men and women are testosterone depleted when they come home. Basically, if you if we go take a step back and look at how men and women respond to stress differently, because of the way our brains are formulated. Men have brains that are two distinct hemispheres and that they are actually capable of switching off whatever hemisphere is not being used. Did you know that? I didn't. That's fascinating. I think it's fascinating too because when you ask a man, what are you thinking of, darling? And he says nothing. I mean, I think universally women go he's thinking of another woman or he's thinking of something shameful because we simply are unable to understand that men can switch half their brain off ours is active the I whole time we have see. this network all connecting all the bits of our brain so when we get a piece of information in our left brain we're instantly checking it out on our right brain and vice versa so men's way of re well stress causes us to to our, our hormone levels to to go up and down and and um they're constantly adjusting so for women to deal with their stress they need a hormone called oxytocin that's what cuts the cortisol in their bloodstream. And cortisol is the, the destructive stress hormone. What men need to cut their cortisol is testosterone. They need their testosterone levels to rebuild. And the way they do that is to become a couch potato and withdraw. So we have this situation where when you both have two couples, uh, two people in a couple coming home from work, where still primarily women take responsibility because they see and connect all the details of the household and the children and the schedules and all that kind of thing. Their brains are, are well adapted to do that. We've done that for millennia. So men just want to collapse in front of the TV and look like a bump on a log. And actually, it's a sight that when a woman's stressed and she's aware of how much she's got to do, can actually make her sort of dream of, of blunt objects and sh cries of rage. You know, <laughs> who are you to relax and let me do, do all the work? Yeah. But actually, he's doing what he needs to do. But if he knows that by coming home and taking half an hour to connect, because our brains are connected everywhere, we need to connect when we're stressed. And for somebody to just sit and listen and say, oh my God, that must have been hard. Oh, you know, oh yeah, gotcha. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember. But actually what men try to do, because that's the way things work on Mars and we all think, you know, if we're doing our best for each other, we would do what we would like to have done. It doesn't work in a heterosexual relationship so well. Um, so a man will try and fix you. So when you're saying, and then I did so and so, and then I did so and so, and oh, you, you, you know, you should give up that job. No, I like my job. It's just... A woman needs to connect and 
to to be debriefed by a man who has become an expert at debriefing and listening properly and then given a hug she that's it her her hormones are balanced again that is just major oxytocin uh, oxytocin recharge and then he can go off and lie on the sofa and recharge his testosterone and then hopefully you all come together later in the evening and continue the love affair this sounds like something that we should all be instructed on before we enter into a long-term relationship i think it's absolutely vital and everybody should listen to this it is fascinating isn't it it is extraordinary um and I've always known, I mean, I read Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus when my first marriage was heading towards the rocks. And, and I do think that I could perhaps have rescued that marriage um, if I hadn't had that whole, you know, cancer, cancer death sentence stuff going on. Um, because that, um, that was a real deal breaker on so many levels. Um, but that's why I've decided to become a gender intelligent dating coach is because if you get the fundamentals right, your relationship can go the distance so that you can enjoy your grandchildren together and, um, and have that really, that, that's just to me a definition of success which However hard I work now, I'm never going to get it for myself, but I'd love to have it for my son and for my godchildren and for my clients. You mentioned your cancer journey and um, we won't go into it in detail in this interview, but um, just for the benefit of the listeners um, to, to just summarise briefly. And there, there is a full interview already out on, uh, on my podcast. So if listeners would like to search <laughs> Kit Stapley they'll find the full recording on there. So just just, just um, tell us, you mentioned about a cancer death sentence kit. What, 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 was, what happened? Well, in 1992, I was diagnosed with um, an incurable lymphoma, but the good news was it was treatable. And boy, did they treat me. <laughs> over, over five years, I... You know a little bit longer but in total of the treatments i had um i lost my hair five times and eventually when it got aggressive that treatment was when it was still indolent in an effort to keep it under control i think they handle it differently these days um, but this was 1990 well, the 1990s then in 1997 it got aggressive and they decided that it was worth doing a stem cell transplant, which in those days carried quite a high mortality risk. And I relapsed from that less than a year later. And then they told me they were clean out of drugs. There was only two left that I hadn't already had the legal limit of. And um, if those worked, he told me very frankly, it was just about extending my life, but he promised he wouldn't let me suffer. And at that point I went, yeah, I'm not ready to go. I, I want a miracle. And the, the general sort of opinion was Kit's been so brave with all the treatment up to now, but, uh, but now she's gone into denial, <laughs> poor thing. And, um, and actually my two oncologists, one in New York and one in London, and my then husband who believed them implicitly, they're all dead and I'm still here, so <laughs> go figure. I love, I love that. I, that. I so often refer to you and, and I say, you know, when people say to me, or, you know, anybody that I'm um, mentoring through cancer, you know, what, what, what do you think is the hope? You know, there's always hope. And I, and I always pull out your, your story, you know, and uh, it's, it's just amazing. I think it's a, it's a case of you, you mentioned that you wanted a miracle and you weren't ready to go. And that's so, so important for people to realise that to, to a great extent, they're in control, aren't they? Once you make a decision and you're, you know, you go full head on into whatever you want to do, like now you've, you've reinvented yourself yet again as a, as a gender intelligent dating coach. And what a great title that is. It's so, it's, 
it, <laughs> it asks questions. You think, what, what the heck's that? But actually, it's very straightforward. Um, it's an it's a gender intelligent dating co coach. The intelligence between the two genders. Um, helping people to to do the, the dating courting ritual properly exactly and um, you know I'm also a, a Louise Hay heal your life teacher in my life as I look back over my life and and as I look forward into my life the principle that I first learned from Louise Hay which is that what you think about you create. I can see that has operated completely in my life, my whole life. I have created whatever I thought about. So when I thought about unhappiness and chaos and illness and, and didn't take steps to, to move out of the dis-ease that leads to disease, as you and I both believe, um, that's what I created. And I actually remember when, when my ill health first began in New York, saying to myself, God, I wish somebody could diagnose something. I, you know, I'd give anything for a diagnosis, this not feeling well, spending days in bed with the temperature, with no specific thing. And then I got a cancer diagnosis. So, you know, you do get what you think about. So there's, there's a huge amount of, of mental hygiene that Louise Hay stressed and um, I don't think that the, the secret which um, used a lot of those principles that were so familiar to us from Louise Hay actually managed to include that so when I work with clients when I worked with cancer clients now I'm working with with um, Mars Venus dating clients I don't I deal with relationships sort of all together but when I'm dealing with them, I help people to begin to change their mind because I firmly believe that I actually changed my mind about dying of cancer. And I understand how very easy it is when an expert in a white coat tells you you're going to die. A lot of people just obediently go ahead and die because that's what they've been told their horizon is. And it narrows onto that and that's what they create. And that's what I've seen happen so many times. And that leads me on to the DISC behavioural profiling that, that, that we both know about. And uh, when I've concentrated, well, not concentrated, I've become an expert in, in the last 20 years. And that's about relationships and behaviour and how our behaviour yeah, yeah. affects people, um, people's lives, their business success or, or otherwise, and specifically their health. And absolutely. The, you mentioned about um, when men and women come home from work and their different um, behaviours, et cetera, and how they can wind each other up and, and pretty much destroy each other. But um, yeah. I, but, um, I, I first noticed that when my son was, was small. He's now, gosh, what's he, 26? Uh, yeah, 26. And um, when he was coming mm -hmm. from school, we didn't know he was autistic at that stage. We just knew that we had a child that was, was a bit different. and um, he would come home and withdraw from, you know, from he'd come home from school and withdraw. And there's yeah, me yeah. chatting for England and yeah, yeah. not realizing that I was winding him up. And then we'd end up with, you know, a few words. But I put that down to differences in personality style because his personality style is totally different from mine. Mine is chatty, outgoing, and fun loving, whereas his is very serious and everything is taken literally and because now subsequently um, we found he was autistic and with autism and I understand that most men or many men obviously have hugely generalizing here that many men are, are on the autistic spectrum to some degree so when you say something to a man you do need to be very specific because mm -hmm. that's how they that's how their mind works they need to know exactly what's expected of them they're not yeah. able to multitask, as you've clearly explained earlier on. Um, they don't have the mental capacity. Their brain is wired differently. So it's not a case of one's better than another. We're all different, aren't we? And it's when you understand the differences. So from my point of view, I look at it in terms of behaviour. From your perspective, you're now looking at it in terms of the, the wiring of the brain and 
the 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 Venus and the Mars perspective. So there's you know my 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 parents used to say there's more than one way to skin a cat, and um, it's it's you know all these different approaches as we age and we our grey hair appears. You know we've we've learned all of this stuff by by intuition, by experience, and by the various different studying that we've done. It's it's just amazing. Because behavior is is the um, outward demonstration of what we're thinking. Sometimes when when somebody's you know those people who just everything they say they're miserable and they're critical and they're judgmental and whatever. And however much it stings when they're so judgmental of me, I just think to myself, oh my God, it's bad enough being on the receiving end of your thoughts in that particular, but I can get away from you and you're stuck in that brain the whole day. Your life must be horrible. Um, but our behavior, our pictures are what's going on in our minds when you talked about your son sort of just wanting to close off at the end of the day i i was i was very close to my mother and we were three sisters and a mother and um and we you know my father had a very traditional role at that in those days in the 50s and 60s so we'd come home from school and we'd all sit around in turn who had ever had the most exciting story to tell would tell what what had happened that day i mean it was like a soap opera in our house at tea time the whole time and so when i was living in new york and and married to peter i'd come home and i'd tell him my story literally the story of my day because that's how we did it in an intimate situation with the four of us women and his reaction which used to hurt me bitterly was could you skip to the bottom line mm. i mean could you just what what's the point yes yes <laughs> the point was the connection and the story and the laughs along the way but it just wasn't you know that was a communication issue that now of course i'd be able to to look at it and go okay what's wrong with this communication but i just thought if you loved someone you treated them the way you wanted to be treated and he was a brilliant raconteur so i loved listening to his stories my um my third husband um i've not had a terribly good record on uh, the the, uh, the the wedding side um no darling but you know what experience i i'm an expert in divorces i've been through three one of my own and one of peter's and one of simon's yes yeah yes exactly well, that's what yes. we get that's that's how we get this these gray hairs it's it's the experience yeah. anyway go on sorry well my and i i'm actually still married to my third husband and um we we didn't know as i say that that our son um was autistic and we used to laugh about um the fact that Brian was the um, the most normal out of his family, but we didn't we didn't know anything about um, Asperger's syndrome at the time. And over the years, I've learned about it, and I've I've helped set up um, a branch of the National Autistic Society. I've done all kind of support um, volunteering with with the uh, breaking up. Yeah. So before before that uh, recording blip, we were just talking about uh, the number of uh, divorces and experiences and so on, and. Uh, I was saying that you know I'm actually still married. Um, so so to Brian, we we married in 1992 when you were going through your first cancer malarkey, and um, we're still married to this day. But had I known what I know now about behaviour and autism and so on, how I could have salvaged things and not been so dismissive of of, of behaviour, which I thought was so frustrating at the time I, and, and I couldn't cope with it. My stress levels were very high. Um, but actually when I look back now, when I reflect, it's just a simple case of men from Mars, women from Venus, plus our totally, totally different behaviors. And I often refer to uh, Brian and my uh, behavior patterns. When I draw on the graph, you can see that our behavior patterns are so completely opposite. And they say opposites attract, but also, 
when you understand one another, you're actually a perfect team because you have all the behaviours needed to deal with anything in life. So if you understand each other on a communication level and never mind emotional level, you can then be a really strong unit. And that's what you've referred to, isn't it, about the understanding and the, the almost like contractual obligation to understand and listen to one another. I can't understand why this stuff isn't taught in schools because it's actually, it's, it underpins the whole country's economy. You know, couples with divorce and single parents create terrible problems in their children and women's are most disadvantaged when they're, they're single mothers with, with children because they can't work and they have no support and backup and um, in economic and, and emotional terms. And if, if we just practice to get this right in the first place, we could avoid so much stress, unhappiness and, and, and children's stress because when parents are under stress, children are under stress. Absolutely. And that's why I'm currently having developed my own behavioural profiling tool, which is an online facility through my website, which I'm planning to have available free of charge at the point of use for schools. Um, as, as you've mentioned, if we were taught this in school, if we were taught how our behaviours affect our whole life, our business and our, our health, then we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today we you know in in the worldwide crisis um absolutely you know it, it's just it's just so so simple yet so um alien to people to think about this sort of stuff because it's not in the curriculum is it you know if, it's not like learning geography or or um i don't know history or something um learning it's not even in the conversation you know a man I love very much, he's, he's one of my stepsons, said to me when I told him I was, I was training for Mars Venus and told him a little bit about some of the fascinating things I was discussing. And he said, when you're qualified, I really want to talk more about this with you. Now, from the outside, his marriage is, his whole life is like a picture perfect. He's got a wonderful wife. They're, they share um, responsibilities beautifully. They've got three wonderful children that they're really involved with. Um, and at, at the bar mitzvahs, he talks to his children and they look at him in a way that literally brings tears to my eyes because it's so beautiful. And even he has things that he doesn't understand about his relationship with his utterly lovely wife, who he adores and she adores him. So yes. I'm really thrilled to be doing this work um, because I think it's, it could have a huge impact on our country. And you were the first to be trained in the UK in this particular method. There are two other Mars Venus coaches and a lot of my work at the moment in preparation, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, but I'm properly launching in September because, you know, it's Winston Churchill said that, that um, America and the UK are two nations divided by common language. And that's so true. So I'm de-Americanizing a lot of the materials so that, um, so that there isn't the, that sort of um, obstruction. There's an obstruction in communication between the English and the Americans. The Americans tend to um, have great respect and admiration for the English. And I think that, the, I think I detect a, a sort of, um, post-imperial jealousy in the English reactions to the Americans. It's like, you know, we were the most powerful country in the world for so long and now America is. And, and you know, it's like when your, your team is not in Parliament, everything that they do is wrong. And so I, I think I see that. But in order for people to understand these 
universal issues, I'm sort of adapting the materials because I am the third person in Britain to train as, um, as a Mars Venus coach, but I'm the only one to specialize in dating because I'm, I want to go back to the beginning of relationships so that people who work with me will work with me in a way that um, if you get it all going with understanding and, and sympathy and, and commitment to helping each other to be the happiest you can be right at the beginning, that must reap dividends for cancer later on. Did I mention that in my over 15 years of working with primarily cancer um, clients, I only once came across a woman that did not have an intractable relationship issue that clearly had contributed to her health picture. That's very interesting and, and we know that there's lots of reasons why, why we get cancer and um, Cancer Research UK claim that um, by, is it 2020, 2025, I can't remember what, what year they, they predicted, I mean it's either upon us now or, or nearly upon us, that one in two of us will have cancer. Well, the people underestimate, and I don't think they talk too much about this, the level of stress um, is a huge factor in cancer. Wherever the stress comes from is not is almost immaterial. It's the fact that we're stressed and when our body is stressed, our whole immune system is compromised and stress comes from divorce, to unhappy relationships. It, it, it's To me, I think it's probably the biggest factor um, in cancer and uh, the stress relationships not just at home but at work you know because so th this can this is carried through into the workplace isn't it your colleagues if you don't understand your colleagues and there's many of us um, I've, I've I've only worked 12 years in corporate in, in my life and I was a woman in a man's world and um, yeah. the, the difference in communication um, I was always, you know, so I'd, I'd be running, I'd be running finance meetings with teams of lawyers and barristers, and um, uh, talking with them on, on, on a financial level with with the business, um, as opposed to the legal professional relationship that they had with their clients. I had the financial relationship, and the stress levels with it, with around that table was huge, absolutely mm -hmm. huge. So I would be taking things totally different to how they would be experiencing the conversation. So it's stress at work, it's stress at home. And as you say, if we could learn this at an earlier age. So going forward, when you're, for, you know, when you're properly launching, how, how, how much of your work do you think will be in with adults or or versus how much maybe with younger people because there's, there's two ends of the spectrum here to consider aren't there there are two ends i i i plan to be coaching one-on-one -on -one with adults really not with children so much um partly because i haven't worked with children and you need so many qualifications and clearances and and um, and all that to do that but also I think that every relationship has its own balance and balance is absolutely crucial in a relationship so if you can help people at the beginning of the relationship to understand that um, if if one let's start at the, there are five stages of dating and i'm speaking as a woman who would love to have a daughter-in-law and would love to have grandchildren and i have a, a son who is gorgeous um and has a very um interesting journey as far as his love life is concerned um, but 
because of what I know about the stages of dating, which I actually, when my marriage broke up, I read Mars and Venus on a date and I, I used it and I changed my performance so that I am now married to the most perfect man for me. We're very different, but that means we cover a very broad area of competence together. And if you get it sorted out right at the beginning, it just illuminates everything. It opens, opens a relationship up like a flower to really properly bloom as nature intended. How long have you been married now to Simon? 15 years. <laughs> Doesn't seem possible. <laughs> We still feel like newlyweds. I just the the years are um, uh, are amazing to me. Fabulous. So um, when we spoke about doing this interview, um, you sent a script. Can we talk about the script and the 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 how important it is to use the right tone? And you alluded at the beginning of the interview about explaining what's needed rather than just saying you know a sentence and then expecting somebody to understand it should we should we use it as an yes. example for listeners because i think that's quite um quite useful um you sent me Great. This with tom and mary and um, so can you just introduce what we're going to do so yes if it, listening skills are crucial to a relationship now um as we were talking about earlier, you know, women, Venusians, just want to share her feelings about the day and, and connect. That, that's really the, the, um, the, the most important thing to rebuild her oxytocin. And very often, the partner, thinking he's helping her, is is offering a steady flow of solutions to her problems, which absolutely, well, let's, let's do the script. You're going to be Mary, right, Elaine? I'm going to be Mary, yes. I'm going to be Mary, okay. I'm going to be Tom. Okay. okay, great. So here we go, so I'm Mary. There's so much to do, I don't have any time for myself. You should quit that job. You don't have to work so hard. Find something you like to do. But I like my job. They just expect me to change everything at a moment's notice. Don't listen to them. Just do what you can do. I am. Anyway, I can't believe I completely forgot to call my mum today. Don't worry about it. She'll understand. Do you know what she's going through right now? She needs me. You worry too much. That's why you're always unhappy. I'm not always unhappy. Can't you just listen to me? I am listening. Oh, why do I even bother? Exactly. See, Tom actually thought he was doing a great job being in her corner and on her team and giving her suggestions and trying to solve her problems because testosterone that's what testosterone makes you want to do. It makes you want to be successful, solving problems and action and things. So Mary was completely frustrated by Tom's interruptions. And actually, that her stress and anger built through that conversation. And by the end of it, she was more frustrated than when she'd arrived home. So the next role play we're going to demonstrate is the same conversation, but handled differently using some listening techniques. So here we go. Mary says, There's so much to do. I have no time for me. Hmm. Sounds like you had a really hard day expect me to change everything at a moment's notice i don't know what to do really i even forgot to call mom today oh no she needs me so much right now i feel really bad i know 
you're such a loving person. Come here and give me a hug. I love talking with you. You make me feel really happy. Thank you for listening. I feel so much better. Brilliant. So can you hear the difference? Even though we were only acting, could you see the difference in the conversations? In the second example, Tom was using the techniques of listening without giving suggestions and using just encouraging remarks which build empathy and those little noises of reassurance showing that he was sympathetic but not dominating the conversation. Of course, the trick is to do it so you don't sound patronizing. Yes. <laughs> I mean, a lot of what I teach is about men and women understanding and balancing their needs in active cooperation with their partner. And so that's that lovely thing about intimacy is that when you trust somebody with your vulnerabilities and they will then be trustworthy with your vulnerabilities, and that builds, you know, intimacy is not just sex. Intimacy is so much that's behavioral and in a glance and the press of a hand and, and all those things. Um, and I read a couple of articles lately. Um, I'm making a collection of them, which is really interesting. I don't know whether I'm just noticing them more at the moment because of what I'm doing or whether the zeitgeist is, is sort of there. But I've read um, a, um, an article by a gay man who say, we don't have the communication issues between us that, um, that heterosexual couples have. And I've read an article by... Um, a gay woman who says that her wife and her divide the chores and all those kind of things so equably equitably and they don't have the problems that heterosexual relationships have and the reason for that obviously is that their brain is wired the same way so they actually understand where each other is coming from so that communication gap in heterosexual couples is where I want to be working so that they have the, the frictionless way of dealing with things that these um, same-sex couples seems to, seems to benefit from. That's, that's a fascinating observation, Kit, because when I reflect on the number of friends I have of all kinds of persuasions, I don't, I don't remember any of my lesbian friends and gay men friends who are in you know serious relationships ever having a crossword with each other and when you point out actually it's bleeding obvious because they're what their brains are wired the same so therefore they understand don't they how interesting isn't it fascinating? And I tell you what is also, especially, I mean, I love my gay friends. And, and I, one of the reasons I love my gay friends is because that word gay, which when I was growing up, was one of my favorite words because it is a, just a, a carefree lightheartedness that it conveys. And for years I resented um, gay men kind of having appropriated that word. But actually, gay men in a happy relationship have so much humor and, and acceptance and relaxedness between them, don't they? Absolutely. And I've, I've observed it, you know, close up many times, as you say, with, with, uh, with both, both um, uh, sexes. And then with heterosexual relationships, you know, divorce and um, arguments is, is, is very commonplace. So. Mm. I wish you very well with this um, this new venture. It sounds absolutely fascinating, and I've learned a lot just just by talking with you and listening to you now. So hopefully, our listeners have, um, have benefited. And um, let's talk about your song choices. And um, because we're going straight to podcast rather than the radio show now, I'm not allowed to play the songs in full. Um, however, they right. will appear on the playlist, and my PA puts together the playlist. Uh, we've got I think nearly 200 songs now for past guests have chosen and and your previous songs were were on there 
um, are on there somewhere. You've chosen Happy Talk from South Pacific and Whistle a Happy Tune from The King and I. Why did you choose both of those, Kit? Well, you know, I, this thing about your mind and the thoughts that you think creating your reality is, is really potent for me. And in these COVID times, when so much is thrown up into the air and it's very, very stressful for, for, for quite a lot of people, I just thought if, if people chanced to get an earworm from my choices, that I would like them to be like walking mantras so that they would be walking around sort of going, um, whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune and no one will suspect I'm afraid. And that, I mean, that's worked for me all my life. That was the first psychology that I ever, I ever um, heard of. And you, you're very welcome to cut the singing there. Um, leave it to Deborah Carr. And... <laughs> Um, and it's the same same thing with happy talk. Talk about things you like to do, um, and of course that's talk about a girl, talk about a boy. Saying you know, so it, it hinged into my dating thing. But both of those, if you happen to get an earworm, they might contribute to actually making your day better and changing your thoughts in that direction. That was my very coachy kind of choice. <laughs> Yeah, very good. I thought of other of other ones too. I mean, I love um, Eric Idle. Always look on the bright side of life. I mean, those things they they do change my day. Um, if I they sort of suddenly come into my mind, and I go, yeah, that works. Brilliant. It, music is a, a great leveler, and it's a great form of inspiration um, to to lift our spirits, isn't it? I, I, I wholly agree with you on that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, there's there's a little song which I used to do with my laughter um, therapy workshops, which um, an Australian brain expert has suggested that people use instead of happy birthday as, as their hand washing song, um, which goes, oh, here we go. Brace yourself. Every little cell in my body is happy. Every little cell in my body is well. Every little cell in my body is happy. Every little cell in my body is well. I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well. I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well. And I just think if every time you wash your hands, you do it to that. You'll walk away going, you know what? Yeah, I've just invigorated every little cell in my body and pitched it toward, because we know holistically that that actually works, don't we, Elaine? We do, absolutely. Surround yourself with positive people, give yourself a positive mind, and um, everything will be wonderful. Sunny side up. So, Kit, you mentioned about five stages of dating. What, what do you mean by five stages of dating? Well, actually, what seems like a, a sort of seamless experience has five definite stages. Number one is attraction, which is fairly easy to understand. Um, but it's quite interesting to look at what it is that attracts you um, and take a moment to think of the things that attract you. Um, for me, it's highly idiosyncratic for everybody. For me, it's Kickers are hands, foreheads, and handwriting, you know, because there's the general attraction and the, the, the looks thing and all that. Um, but I wound up married to a man who has great hands. The forehead that actually attracted me to my first husband after I'd known Simon before, and his handwriting is so lovely that when we first got back together again um, and I was very familiar but with his handwriting in memory but I actually used to get turned on watching him write oh, so attraction is is you know in the workshop we go into it in much more detail but it's it's really um, 
highly idiosyncratic and it's really as well to know and understand another example is you know people who say oh i'm always attracted to a bad boy i would i wonder why my relationships always go wrong <laughs> um hello mm -hmm. you need you need in a long-term relationship you need that your values are similar so that you can be you know um broadly harmonious and then stage two is uncertainty because we we experience a shift from feeling attraction to to feeling you know yeah i'm not sure this guy's right for me um and the challenge in this stage is to recognize that uncertainty is normal and not be put off by it and it can express itself in all kinds of ways but what happens is that for instance we'll we'll just you know have their their default uncertainty and what also happens in that relationship is if a man backs off which is a manny kind of thing to do it's what men do when they have a problem they don't want to talk about it they just back off well for a woman it makes her crazy so she starts ringing him up and that's the death knell of what could have been a really potentially good um, relationship if you, if you work through it mindfully. So then in stage three, if these are all in the right sort of order, and I have to say that for a bit of fun, if that's what, you know, rings your chimes, it's fine to go out with somebody and you know go to bed with them right away and have great sex but if you're trying to look for a life partner that's not a great way to go about it it's much better to wait and um because stage three is exclusivity now i found dating so much fun because until somebody asked me um for exclusivity i just went out with everybody who asked me and i didn't think twice about it but i see in in young women today an intensity about finding the one and overloading a relationship before the the, the foundations get properly established so after exclusivity then you get to intimacy now it's it's a biological fact that men rush into physical intimacy and women rush into emotional intimacy and that's an unbalanced thing so that can scupper a relationship which could have worked if it had been handled properly and then the final stage is engagement and at that stage there's a certainty that this is the person that you want to marry settle down with couple up with and you you actually you know that's a that's a major rite of passage a hundred years ago for couples it's then you declare your um your relation to the world and you commit to building that relationship that will go the distance and hopefully um take you to your children having an unbroken home and you enjoying your grandchildren together and i just see that as such a lovely thing about success that if i had known that when i was in my 20s i could have built that but it never occurred to me until i had gray hair that that was a desirable object in life so those are the five stages of dating you start off with attraction then you go into uncertainty then it's exclusivity and then it's intimacy and then it's engagement i find the um the, ex the sections three and four most interesting what you said about um women go for emotional um side of things whereas the men go for the sexual side of things and that's yeah. that's a deal breaker isn't it? it really is it's deal breaker change maker um, on so many well, if, different levels and the timing of when that happens exactly exactly and and you know the thing is that the women today think they're being so liberated um 
a journalist I admired to the extent, she, she's in her 30s, to the extent that I looked her up and I was going to write to her and say, I think you're my daughter-in-law. Yes. <laughs> and, and I want you to meet my son. Um, and then I read a book that she'd written where she talked about going to a party and and having sex in a in a cupboard with a man she'd never met before and i went oh i'm not so sure you're that you're you're my daughter-in-law actually mm -hmm. after after all because actually you know women have bought into this idea that that is what is fulfilling for them that the freedom to be who they are and to screw who they like and all that and i kind of relate to that but when you're looking for a full-time relationship, a relationship that's going to go Darby and Joan, if anybody still knows that expression, mm -hmm. what you need is to take it a bit gently. So often people marry their best friends because they've unwittingly gone through all those stages successfully without really thinking about it. Marvellous, thank you very much, Kit. That's a, a great explanation of the five stages of dating. Thank you so much, Kit Stately, for talking with me today. And um, I wish you well. And uh, we'll be following your progress with interest and seeing you transform the world. What a lovely thing to say. Thanks, Elaine. I've really loved it.